that, let's get into the message. And it's entitled, It's Time. It's Time. Last week, we looked at the first part of Romans 13. And now, we're going to be looking at the last part of Romans 13. And I'm starting with verse 11. Romans 13, verse 11. Do this. Well, what's this? Well, what Paul just wrote before in Romans 13, and the first part was submit to the governing authorities. And then secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says, do this, submit to the governing authorities and love your neighbor as yourself, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and, and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in divisiveness or jealousy. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't even think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So here's how I want to outline this message. It's like this. It's time. So wake up, clean up, and suit up. First of all, it's time. My friends, it's time. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, hence Romans, says, do this understanding the present time. Now, in Greek, there are two different words for time. One is chronos. That's like normal time, like the time on your, your watch, um, time cards and all that kind of stuff. And then you have kairos, which is more the special time, the appointed time, the, the opportune time, the time that's right now, the time you've got to do something with right now now. And the word that Paul uses here is not chronos, normal time. He uses kairos. There is a special time that we are living in. It's an appointed time. It's a time that we must embrace, a time we must seize. He goes on, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is is almost here. What day? Well, daylight, the time of light, but ultimately the day of Jesus' return in which he comes in glorious light and brings light and washes away all the darkness, all the evil. And Paul is saying that day is almost here. Think about it. The, the time of darkness is almost over. Now, someone living 2,000 years later, and, you know, I'm thinking, maybe you're thinking, wasn't Paul like a little premature in saying, hey, like the day is almost here, the night is almost over. I mean, it's been 2,000 years, and the day of Jesus' return has not come back. Was Paul just being immature, impatient? And the answer is absolutely not. Because the Bible divides time into basically two epochs or two ages. You got the present age, which would be an age of darkness. And that started with Adam and Eve's rebellion against God in the Garden of Eden. And it goes to the end of time. And then you have the future age, which is the golden age, the new age, the messianic age, meaning the, the age of the Messiah. And, and interestingly, there is an age that's in between that. And here's a little diagram to help you with that. So you got the present age, and then you got the future age. See that overlapping, and it creates that box called the in-between. That in-between time starts with that line, and what's that line? That's the first coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus invaded enemy-occupied territory as a little baby boy. And that in-between time ends when this present age ends. And when is that? Say it. When Jesus Christ comes again on the day of his 
return. And at that point, time ends, the present evil age ends, and all we get is that perfect future age with Jesus. But right now, we live in between. And Paul lived here. He lived in that in-between, closer to the first coming of Jesus. And we live here as well, a little closer to the second return of Jesus. And the question is, when is Jesus going to come back? Well, we don't know. <laughs> we must always be ready, right? But Paul, here we were 2,000 years later, but we're still in that in-between time. And the return of Christ can come crashing in upon us at any moment. That could be Maybe by the end of my message. Maybe by the end of this day. It may be 2,000 years from now. We don't know. But here's the point. The present is pregnant with the future. The future has already come through Jesus Christ. The future kingdom of God has already come when the king invaded enemy occupied territory so the new age of the kingdom has begun and that future age the future will be fully present at any moment and my friends those truths applied to paul 2,000 years ago they apply to us today and if jesus takes another 2,000 years from now it will apply as much as that to our descendants here's the point it's time. Live for Jesus the King now. It's time. You must realize it's time. Well, how do we live for Jesus now? What, what, what does that look like? Well, that's what Paul outlines here. He says, first of all, wake up. <laughs> it's time to wake up. The hour has already come for you to Wake up from your slumber. In other words, stop hitting the snooze button and get some coffee or even an energy drink, whatever you need to do to wake up, but you must wake up. And of course, I'm not talking physically. I'm talking spiritually. But don't you just kind of want to roll it back into bed some days and just put the covers over your head and just say, go away. You know, all this COVID-19 stuff and all this unrest and in the... In, in the United States and around the world and with this election coming and with the finances and with everything. I mean, just, I want it to go away. And so I just keep hitting snooze and I just roll back over and I try to go back to sleep. And Paul says, don't do it. Stop hitting the snooze button. Get some coffee, get an energy drink, but you must wake up. Secondly, Paul says, clean up. After you wake up, get cleaned up. He says, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in divisiveness or jealousy. And so Paul says, clean up. Put aside the deeds of darkness. What's, what's he talking about? Well, the deeds of the party life. You know, the, the high life, the staying out late and partying and hitting, hitting the booze and hitting the drugs and the whole party life. He says, well, yeah, of course not, right? But you know what? Paul's writing this letter to Christians, right? This wasn't to the pagans in Rome. This was to the saints in Rome, the Christians in Rome. He's saying, Christians, it's time to stop the party li living. Secondly, he says, set aside the sexualized lifestyle, the sensual lifestyle. It's not about lust. It's not about turning each other on. It's not about pornography. Set that aside. And once again, he's writing to Christians. He says, set aside the deeds of darkness, this sexualized lifestyle. And finally, Set aside the divisive lifestyle. You know that person on Facebook who's just, you know, just all capping and all over the place and just spraying hate and rage and all over the place. 
We are not to be divisive. We are not to be quarrelsome. We are not to be jealous. And once again, he's writing this to Christians. Why? Because that's exactly how Christians were living in Paul's day in Rome. And it's exactly how some of us live. Maybe not all three, but maybe one of the three. And I mean, I, I can relate. It's not just for those out there. And of course, these are spectrum things, right? I mean, there's the party lifestyle where you're like, you know, drunk all the time. And then there's the lifestyle where you go to the bottle or something to get a buzz just to make it go away. Or those, you know, I mean, you can be into sex trafficking or you can just be clicking on the wrong sites. Or, or you, you know, I mean, like you're not hitting people over the head with your anger, but you can have a lot of rage still going out to your family. But set aside the deeds of darkness. Then he goes on, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't even think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. I love that. Don't even think about how to gratify the the desires of the flesh. What's the flesh? The flesh is that part of you and me, even though we're saved, that still wants to rule itself, that still wants to be in charge, that self-leadership, that thing that says, I want to be God. I want to determine what's right and wrong for me. And it's also that self-centeredness, that not only do I, I want to rule myself, I want to please myself. I want to do what feels right and what I want to do. And Paul says, don't even think about it. <laughs> you know, when the temptation comes from, your, from your, your flesh, whether it's, you know, just deciding what you want to do, regardless of what God tells you to do, or just to meet your own needs, uh, you know, disregarding other people's needs. Paul says, don't even think about it. Don't even go there. Just brush it off and say, it's not who I am. I'm not a person of the darkness any longer. I'm a person of the light. And so it's time to wake up. It's time to clean up. And thirdly, it's time to suit up. Paul says, put on the weapons of light. He also said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, put on the weapons of light. Why do we need weapons, weapons of light? Because we are in a battle, a battle between light and darkness, between Jesus' kingdom and the kingdom of darkness, between good and evil, between the light and between darkness. We are in a battle. And if we had the eyes to see, the spiritual eyes to see what's actually going on in the spiritual realm, we would be completely blown away because if we could see what's actually happening around us right now what's happening in our society what happens in schools and universities what we would see as a battle going on between angels of light and the demons of darkness rulers of this current evil world and we would be completely blown away that there's actually a whole other realm at war influencing us. I love the story of Elisha in the Old Testament. He was reading uh, the king of Midian's mail. <laughs> the king of Midian would say, hey, let's go attack the Israelites and we're going to do it here. And he would put his finger on the map. And you know what? Elisha, through the prophetic gifting that God had given him, saw that or heard that and went to the king of Israel and said, he's going to attack you here. So the king of Israel got in place. And when the Midianites came, he pushed them back. And, you know, it's like he, that happened like five times in a row. And finally, the king of Midian goes, it's like, who's the mole? Who, who's telling the king of Israel my plans? And someone's, no, it's none of us. It's the prophet Elisha. 
Like he can read your dreams. He can hear us talk. He can read your thoughts. And he hears your plans and he shares them with the Israelite king. And the Midianites said, king said, go get them. So he sent troops of chariots and horses and a strong army. <laughs> We're talking a huge army. And it shows up at the doorstep of Elisha. And it's in the morning, and Elisha's servant looks out the front window and goes, Holy smokes! There's a huge army out there, Elisha! And Elisha just takes his coffee, opens the front door, goes out on the front porch, sits on the, on the rocker and goes, Yeah, well, there's more with us than with them. And his servant says, what, what are you talking about? And Elisha prayed. 2 Kings 6 through 17. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the servant. And he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. Angelic hosts, the angelic army, all around Elisha. And Elisha just keeps sipping his coffee and rocking in his chair. There's more with us than with them. And my friends, when we go to Curtis Hickson Park this afternoon at 2, guess what? There is more with us than with them. There is nothing to be afraid of. So what do we do? We suit up suit up we put on the weapons of light because we are in a battle between the light and darkness and so we are to take up our combat gear i use that very specifically that different translations of this very verse sometimes has the armor of light or the weapons of light and, and they both have different sort of connotations, right? I mean, if you have a, uh, uh, an arm of light, it's like you're, you're protected. It's kind of a passive thing, right? But if you have a weapon of light, it's kind of aggressive. You know, you're attacking. You're going to do some damage. So what is it? Well, it's actually both. And so I think the better translation is combat gear of life. In, in fact, the Greek word is hopla, that means weapon or armor or both. And it simply comes from the Greek soldier, like the Spartans and the Athenians, you know, Spartacus and the 300 and stuff like that. That was a Greek hope light. And they had armor like shields and helmets, but they also had a sword. They put on combat gear. Well, what is the combat gear of the Christian. Well, Paul uses this word several times in his other letters, but here's a great time where I believe he actually outlines what the gear is. Okay, remember the word is hopla. It's either armor or a weapon or both. Here it is. 2 Corinthians 6, 6 to 7. By purity, knowledge, Patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness, hopla of righteousness, for the right hand and for the left hand. I mean, we're talking, we are decked out. What are the weapons? I'll just say them again. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, truthful speech, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, and the power of God. Those are the weapons that we use, and they are not fleshly. They are not human. They come with the very power of God. And Paul says you've got to have one in your right hand and in your left hand. Does that mean you have two swords? No, because every ancient person when they read Paul's word, they're one in the right, one in the left, would immediately think of the Greek hope light or the Roman centurion. In one hand, 
he would have a shield. And in the other hand, he would have a sword. He would have the advantage of God's power for protection, but he would have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to do damage against the kingdom of darkness. And so Paul says, it's time to suit up. Put on your combat gear. Sure, get on your armor, but also get on your weapons. And then he says, put on Jesus himself. Don't just put on these weapons, this combat gear of light, but put on Jesus himself. Like, put on his presence. Always remember that he's with you. You are never alone. Put on his presence. Power, if he is in you, the very power that raised him from the dead is in you. Put on his priorities. Seek first his kingdom, his cause, his mission, and everything else will be added to you. Why? Because we are at war. And we are not citizens anymore. We are soldiers in the army of God. My friends, this passage has incredible historical and theological significance. That's because this very passage is the passage that God used to convert the great Saint Augustine. This is long, long ago, back in the Roman world, before the Roman government fell to the barbarians. Okay? This is long ago. We're talking in the 400s. But St. Augustine was a professor of rhetoric at the University of Milan, a very important university in Italy. Rhetoric, uh, communications, uh, speech, persuasion, how to influence people. And uh, for professional reasons, as a field trip, he wanted to go hear St. Ambrose, who was the bishop of the Catholic Church or the church in Milan. He had heard so much about St. Ambrose. Now, he had no time for the gospel. <laughs> he was a womanizer. He had lots of children out of wedlock. He had lots of women. I mean, he was the guy who was living the party life, the sensual life, the divisive life. That was who he was. But he wanted to go hear St. Ambrose, uh, Ambrose because he knew that he was such a great communicator. Well, he went one time. And then Augustine went again. And again. And not only was he captivated by the skills of the bishop, he began to be captivated by the message of the gospel. And it began to work on him. <laughs> and he prayed this very famous prayer. Maybe, maybe you've prayed it too. Grant me sexual purity and self-control, but not yet. <laughs> you know, help me overcome my rage, but, but not until I get that guy who just cut me off. Or, or help me not click on any more pornography, but, but I just got to finish tonight. <laughs> Grant me sexual purity and self-control but not yet. <laughs> and God heard the prayer because St. Augustine was miserable. <laughs> he kind of had one foot in the world and he was kind of tapping his toe in the foot of the kingdom and the gospel. He was absolutely miserable. And he was outside in a park. And there he sat just trying to sort through this. And all of a sudden, a kid runs by. And he sings out, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. <laughs> and St. Augustine kind of looks at him like, what? He goes, I don't, I mean, what, what song is that? Is that some children's game? And he's going, I don't remember that one. And all of a sudden, it, it struck him. Well, maybe God was talking to him through this little kid. Take up and read. Take up and read. So he had a scroll. So they didn't have books back then. He had a scroll of the book of Romans, what we're just reading. And he unrolls it like this and he plays Bible roulette and he just goes, boom. 
Guess where his finger fell? Are you ready? Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in divisiveness and jealousy. <laughs> Augustine was a pro. He had perfected those sins. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't even think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Ka-boom. And this is what St. Augustine wrote in his great work called Confessions, which is full of him confessing his sins. I read no further, nor did I need to. For in an instant, after finishing that sentence, a light, a peace filled my heart. And all the darkness of doubt vanished away. <laughs> he knew that it was the truth. And he gave his life to King Jesus. And I'm here to say that this is of great historical and theological significance. Because every Christian claims St. Augustine as their saint. Obviously, the Catholic Church does. The Eastern Orthodox Church does as well. But even the Protestants do. Because did you know that Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation, was actually an Augustinian monk after the order of Augustine. And he was studying the book of Romans, reading Augustine's commentaries. And he came to see that it is by faith through, by grace, through faith alone that we are saved. And the Protestant Reformation began. And then John Calvin, the one who systematized the Reformation, he actually cut his theological teeth on St. Augustine, who opened the world a pall to him. And so the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox and the Protestants all claim Augustine as their hero. How did God bring it about? Well, he used a praying mother, Monica. She prayed for years. They actually made her a, a, a saint simply for praying for so long until Augustine became uh, saved. He, God used a life of darkness and emptiness and restlessness. God let him stew in his sin. God used a faithful bishop. Bishop Ambrose. God used a simple child. Take up and read. Take up and read. And God used a timely word. A word right from God to Augustine. And here's a famous, famous quote. Maybe, maybe you've heard it from Augustine. Maybe you heard it and you didn't know it was from Augustine. You have made us for yourself, Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And Augustine knew what he was talking about. Augustine wasn't a Christian like as a baby, as a little kid. He, he lived a dark life, a restless life. But when he came to the Lord, he came to rest. You have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. My friends, it's time to wake up, clean up, and suit up. Put on Christ. Put on the combat gear of life, of light, and get into the battle. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper now. And so if you don't have juice and, and bread, why don't, why don't you get that a moment? But I, I want to use St. Augustine's words as the words to help us prepare. Once again, you've made us for yourself, Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Do you know that rest? Do you know Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord? Do you know him as the one who satisfies your hunger? Do you know him as the one who quenches your thirst? Isn't it interesting? The Lord's Supper is about eating and drinking, a 
about filling ourselves with Jesus, not putting him on, but putting him in, so to speak, through faith. I just want to say that this supper is for those who believe, but that shouldn't stop anyone. Because right now you can say, Lord, be my Savior. Be my Lord. Give me that rest for my restlessness. Fill that emptiness with yourself. Satisfy my hunger. Quench my thirst. Help me to know that life isn't about me, but it's about your kingdom. Take, eat, remember and believe that Jesus died to forgive your sins and to satisfy your hunger. And now take drink, remember and believe that Jesus shed his blood to forgive your sins and to quench your deepest thirst. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for opening our eyes. Maybe not like what you did with Elisha's servant um, who actually saw it, but maybe, maybe I would imagine some of us have actually seen it. But you have revealed it to us through your word. And it's simply true. There is a battle going on for our hearts, for our kids, for our society, for education, for politics, for everything. So help us to realize it's time to wake up, clean up, and suit up. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. Here we are. We are here to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen.